gives me great pleasure to welcome Swami Swarupanand ji uh, of Chinmaya Mission. Swami ji, welcome. Thank you. Of course, uh, devotees like me and uh, devotees all around the world would like to know how it all started for you, your passion, and how you got into the mission, what attracted you to the mission. When it all started, really, I cannot tell. Hmm? Because once I met Gurudev, Swami Chinmayananda, and uh, when I look back in my life, I was born in the hospital and delivered by a doctor who was a devotee of Swami Chinmayananda. Okay. As a child, the books that came to me on Ramayan and uh, Bhagavad Gita for children happened to be of Swami Chinmayananda. I had no idea who he was or whose book it was. The first book that inspired me into the logic of spirituality, the logic of religion, the logic of self-development. That book also, later on I found out, had a preface by Swami Chinmayananda. But all I know is, I found the commentary of Swami Chinmayananda when I was just out of college, uh, in my father's office, and I started reading it. And once I started reading it, I couldn't stop reading it. The Bhagavad Gita was so inspiring, it had answers to all life's questions. And that's how I started reading the Bhagavad Gita even before meeting uh, Puja Gurudev. And then uh, at that time I was uh, working in Hong Kong, uh, in my father's business. And then he one day sits a youngster down and tells him that, listen, you know I don't go to listen to the sadhu babas, but here is one sadhu, here is a saint who has no nonsense. With no belief is required, hmm? no hogwash. <laughs> Everything is explained from the scriptures, logically, with all the manner in which we can understand with our mindset, our thinking, our scientific approach to life. And uh, I went and listened to him with no idea who he was, even though I was reading his book. and. Uh, expected that I would have a very serious you know, discourse of do's and don'ts, even though I was reading his such logical explanations. But I was totally blown off like anybody did. That such a great master of knowledge, his humor, his logic, oratory skills, and the way in his presence, he made the truth or the reality, the infinite truth, just appear as a fruit in one's hand. So that's how I met him. Heard him for a couple of years, from a distance, really speaking. And then I joined the Chinmaya Yuva Kendra, the youth group, which of course, as you know, is so active in uh, uh, Australia too. I joined the youth group, and then I had a chance of getting close to him. Then going to Sidbadi for the camps, uh, the retreats, uh, spiritual retreats, and there is where I saw his work also. Mm. How from the smallest of villages to the most remote villages in India, to the biggest city in the world, day and night without any rest, and literally we hardly saw him three hours go into his room for rest. Here's a man whose entire life was for the people. And something that I always wanted in my life and I said that if this has benefited me, if I can be just a little bit part of his great vision, his great mission, then I think I have done something in my life. That's how I joined the mission and joined the Sandipni Sadhnalaya, which is like a seminary where Gurukula, mm -hmm. where we are for two and a half years taught the depths of the spiritual knowledge, which as you know is found in Vedanta. And uh, after that, those of us who want to dedicate our life to bringing this knowledge that gives us happiness and makes people productive members of society. So that's how I got inspired and joined the mission. Swamiji, as you probably know, uh, you rightly pointed out that your own father questioned about uh, you were joining the mission, or uh, he, of course, guided no, you to the... He, in fact, took me there. Right. My father took me to listen to Gurudev. And he was like convincing a teenager that, you know, this is... A, um, teenagers wouldn't want to go and 
listen to a spiritual discourse. So in fact, he didn't know I was already reading his books. But he was trying to convince me that here's a man of no nonsense, a person that you must at least listen to once. After that, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. So he took me there. Right. Now, what I meant was, uh, Swamiji, is that as a parent myself, for example, uh, I would like to see my sons or daughters to go through that beaten path, which is, uh, you know, go to the school, university, get married, have children, mm -hmm. uh, get a job. This is not the beaten path. Mm -hmm. This is, you are straying away from that beaten path, a special path. Does it require a lot of mental resolve to go away from that beaten path and take this path? See, to take the path of total dedication to the service of society or the pursuit of truth, reality or God requires like anything, like a good scientist, like C.V. Raman, Einstein, they had to dedicate their entire life to their research, is it not? Yes. The beaten path is the beaten path where everybody who walks, not knowing that what is the goal and purpose of life, not knowing that there is a greater, more compelling truth that gives more meaning to life than just, you know, eating, sleeping, drinking, making merry. That is the life. And uh, by the way, you said that uh, you know, most people take the beaten path, but you know, most parents come and complain to me how miserable their life is, <laughs> and they want their children to have the same miserable life. Yes, yes. <laughs> but however, the path of sannyas, so the path, path of total dedication, is not for everyone. It's meant for those who are totally dedicated. The spiritual path is meant for us at all stages of our life. See, our Vedic rishis pointed out, when you are a student, you must have the values and duties of a student and which is to gain knowledge, not to just get a degree for earning an income. It's to gain knowledge, to develop skills by which you can contribute to society as well as earn your income, do your duties, not only to you and your family, but to the society. Then you enter the grahastha life or the married life, family life, and the purpose of family life is not just to have children, not to just have praja, but to have supraja. Parenting must be such an art that you bring up uh, children, not just as another, you know, growth in society, but as positive contributors to society, to make the society a more harmonious, better, productive, and today, if you think that our only beaten path means, you know, just grow more and more business or, uh, you know, build more bigger houses, yeah. you know, and uh, nowadays only you can have a couple of children and then put them through the same mill and churn out the same clones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it not? Yes. So, uh, yeah, a few people in society who make difference are the people who act differently. They don't take the same path. They don't take the beaten path. Hmm? They take the path less taken. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, those who have already taken the beaten path, yeah. those who have gone through a grahastashram and now they have got children, yeah. they have got all other uh, uh, emotional links with the society, can they still uh, get to the uh, dedication and uh, service to what, for example, that you are, you have taken the path? See, our normal course in our Rishi culture, in our Hindu religion also, is that you go through the preparation stage, Brahmachari Ashram, that is the student life. And as I said, student life is to gain knowledge of yourself, to have values, to build your character, right. you know, and to know what can be the vision of life. In the married life or family life, you become a member of society that produces, brings in income, not only looks after your family, but also shares it with others. This is called as grahastha dharma, the duty of a 
grahasthas and they are supposed to build the schools because after all their children or the next generations are going to so they contribute for schools and olden times wells uh, to remove the poverty of the country today of course in your nation building programs so this is the duty of a grahastha just not me and my children but to do the duties towards the family that you brought into this world as well as the larger family of society and when you live your life like this you have grateful children children who have got a role model at home they don't turn out to be selfish children who later on don't even care about their parents <laughs> no so that vision that knowledge should be given in our education system and in our family upbringing that was a cultural upbringing that we got when we were growing up in india also which is now going away even in india i think indians are broader at least trying to uh, you know get it back then the next stage is when you come to your stage of retirement you've done your duties you've produced your wealth you've saved enough hmm? now is the time that you can actually fully give yourself to giving something back to society whether it's your knowledge your talent not for yourself earlier you have to earn an income also hmm? so you do what you call service for society this is called as vana prastha and today's terms and term terminologies vana prastha olden times you go to the forest not yet as a sanyasi yes no but by which you do various upasanas means with devotion with love hmm? you think about nature contributing back to nature so far you've only taken as a brahmachari and a grahastha sharing a little now you don't want much so you should give to society back as much as you can mm -hmm. that is vana prastha and if you've lived such a selfless life of karma yoga then you are fit really speaking and there will be that thirst also that finally body is going to die is life as meaningless as being born producing and leaving everything behind and perishing is there more to life who am i what is this universe what is my relationship with this universe who is the cause behind this universe hmm? what is my relationship with that cause vedanta gives us not only the knowledge the vision and the means to develop this amongst those who get totally dedicated naturally when they withdraw into meditation they can't be doing anything outside and they have contributed to society such people are called as sanyasis how the scriptures say that those who do not want even in an early age much for themselves and are very clear about the goal of life then at whatever stage you have dispassion vairagya and that devotion and inspiration that is the time hmm? leave <laughs> mm -hmm. Swami ji, of course, uh, we here in uh, Sydney, and for that matter, some of the uh, Indians who have come out of the country probably are in a very fortunate position that uh, we have a some kind of a financial uh, security in our life. But if you take, for example, the people in India, uh, the uh, our motherland, we, we uh, see a lot of people, majority of the population. In fact, they spend the whole of their life. trying to make bo both ends meet and they don't have really time for uh, you know reflecting uh, or uh, introspection about what they have done for themselves and the society uh, how can those people contribute uh, to uh, missions like kachan mai mission see everybody is contributing hmm? from a sweeper hmm, to a doctor yeah from a clerk to a priest hmm? but the only thing is that people bring in selfishness that everything is for me in bhagavad gita shri krishna says that whatever whatever work you do whatever actions you do besides yourself see how someone else benefits also you don't have to do anything different or anything new if you're a doctor you're earning an income through medicine but have an added value to that you're seeing patients you're giving them medicine hmm? but are you removing that disease hmm? or just giving them a symptomatic hmm, 
treatment. You're a businessman. You're producing wealth in society. You're producing wealth for yourself or you're producing wealth for your nation. No? That is the attitude when it says that you do dedicating to the totality, dedicating to the Lord. So, any action, however little we do, it is the attitude in the action that matters. It's not about a rich person being able to do very charitable, which very often you find rich people don't. <laughs> yeah. And uh, those who don't have much wealth, even from the little that they have, they share with others. No? So, with whatever we have, therefore Bhagavan to Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, what does the Lord need? Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam. Means even the most, uh, the, the littlest of things that you have, are you ready to share from that? Hmm? And that's why, even I was addressing a group of uh, Australians yesterday, business people, hmm. and uh, they're all local Australians, and uh, very sincere people. But they were also wondering, what is the purpose of life? You know, What are we doing here? You know? And uh, they were saying that some of them who have been to India, they say that, whom do we call as poor? Because we only measure them by our standards that oh, they must have this much bigger house or everybody must have a roof. They've got a roof over their head and they are happy because of their attitude, the culture, that knowledge. However, when there is hunger and thirst, hmm, there you don't talk spirituality. You teach the spirituality yeah. to those who can afford and they can go and share with these uh, people. So, you share with them. But remember, some of our greatest saints have come from cobblers, hmm? yes. from weavers, hmm? with the Rai Das, Kabir Das. Hmm? So, they have come from there. And they have come also from the palaces like Meera, yes. Janak Maharaj. You know? So, there is no criteria of poor or rich. And especially our culture is such. Whether you say our Vedic culture, hmm? our Indian culture, hmm? our Hindu culture, it is ingrained in the society. You speak to a taxi driver in India, you speak to a laborer in India, his attitude towards action, his attitude towards, like, oh, of course, there's a lot of distortion, there's corruption, there's poverty, but their acceptance of life makes them cheerful and happy in whatever conditions they are. And in whatever condition we are, poor or rich, when we crave for more and more and more, whether we have or we don't have, we are miserable. <laughs> so, really speaking, that spiritual knowledge is there for them all. The uh, if you take the case of some of the family uh, members, uh, whether it's the husband putting uh, the pressure on wife saying that, uh, look, your first responsibility is for your children, your household chores, and the same thing with wife saying to the husband that uh, you, you, are, you have married by choice and uh, your first responsibility is to look after your wife and children before you go and serve the society. What, what kind of advice would you give them? See, because today in all our upbringing, we have only created a generation of people who are entirely, completely, utterly selfish. <laughs> hmm? It's all about me, me, me. In fact, marriage itself is never about me. The purpose of marriage is about us, not me. You don't have time for me, rather, whatever I for you. That is what goes to make love. And that's why we find families unhappy, disintegrating, you know, divorces, breakups. Because finally it's all about, what about me? What about my feelings? What about my wants? In fact, the very institution of marriage is for people to give up their own likes, dislikes, selfishness in the atmosphere of their family. That's a starting point. That is their, what to say. No, and no one can demand the other person that you are not doing your duties. If we demand our rights, very beautifully Mahatma Gandhi has said, when the Charter of Human Rights was being drafted, all the stalwarts of society were sent uh, a letter that please write what you think are human rights 
Only Mahatma Gandhi wrote back very beautifully. He says, in India, we have a culture of duties, not rights. If you teach people their rights, everybody will demand their rights and there will be a revolt. And there will be no one to get their rights. But you teach people their duties, everyone will get their rights. You teach a man his duty, his wife will get her rights. You teach a woman her duties, every man will get his rights. You teach the parents their duties, the children will get their rights. You teach the children, the parents will get their rights. You teach the society their duties, every nation will get their rights. Or you mean the ministers will get their rights. Teach the ministers their duties and the subjects will get the rights. So we are a culture of duties. No? Ram Chandraji did not ask, didn't you have a duty, oh dad, to ask me before you gave the boon to my mother before I was born? <laughs> yeah. Ram Chandraji knows his duty as a son to protect his father's name, reputation. Thus we are culture of duty. The moment we start hearing, what about me? What about us? What about our family? We're thinking very little. Mm. But the family that serves together not only themselves, but the society will never allow selfishness to come. And from that selfishness comes the ego, you know, the disputes, the frustrations, the sorrows, the disappointments. It will not come. Mm. Therefore, such vision, such knowledge, such culture, such character development should start very early in life. I was just completing yesterday the Aitriya Upanishad where it is clearly pointed out that this knowledge should be given to children in the womb itself. The Chimya Mission not only has for pregnant mothers to come regularly for these uh, sessions but also started Shishu Vihar for infants. infants. We used to have Bal Vihar for children. We had Yuva Kendra for the youth. We had study groups and inquiry for the adults. We found that even children, toddlers, we send them to day care, day care centers and they learn Jack and Jill went up the hill to fell a pitcher, <laughs> fetch a pail of water, Jack fell down and broke his crown. We, we know that. If they can learn that, why can't they learn? Matru Devo Bhava, Pitru Devo Bhava, Acharya Devo Bhava, Atithi Devo Bhava. And you can hear these two year old children when they chant this. Can you imagine the values that they get from now onwards? That consider your mother as God, consider your father as God. This is not for parents to demand, hey, only look after me. You don't have anything to do outside. Even their parents get so selfish. When the children are going out of track, they'll come up to us also. Swamiji, please see, we see all these hundreds of Yuva Kendra youth in your you know, mission and how wonderful they are. Please, please tell them to bring my child. And when children come and get dedicated, oh, do you have to go to the mission every week? Don't you think you should be sitting and watching television with us? <laughs> hmm? You see how very selfish parents themselves become. That they want only the children to be obedient to them. That's it. But you teach them to be obedient to all their elders. They will learn how to be obedient even to their parents. Hmm? Swamiji, of course, uh, that leads me to the next question, Swamiji. Of course, you see a lot of uh, unrest, a lot of mistrust lot of hatred in today's society. Uh, even here in Australia, we are seeing a lot of those things happening. The value systems of those people who are pursuing those goals are very different from the ones that we have been taught, like you said, from the womb. How do we, how can the mission be useful in turning around those people who are straying away from that path and come in the right path and teach them some of our values? See. Mission has been doing that only, hmm? reaching out to the maximum. And those who have benefited are the ones who must go and expose such values hmm, to others. And it is a concentric circle, you know, ripples start. Sometimes the ripples slowly, slowly grow, but soon that ripples becomes a wave. Just as when Gurudev started, after so many years of slavery of India, after all our brainwashing that, you know, our scriptures are all uh, myths uh, and uh, irrelevant and all that. 
and uh, with all the conversions and all the tyranny that took place that the whole spirit of India totally destroyed and he himself was a person who wondered what is all this spirituality uh, required for you know? a bit of a socialist uh, you know yes. uh, uh, background so what is this all this and why are these sadhus wasting their time also preaching all this knowledge which is irrelevant to us and that's what the notion we have and in fact that's so in society that notion continues even now mm -hmm. yeah. yesterday one 60 year old man comes and says that i called up my father who's 95 and i told him that you know uh, i'm going just now to you know listen to a discourse on the upanishad his father said his father said what what's wrong with you <laughs> And the father's in India, mind you. Yes. What's wrong with you? You're very young yet. What are you doing all this for? Which means it's meant for you to just chant something when you die. And hopefully you will be <laughs> in a good place after that, if you do exist after that. No, that is how the notion people have. Yes. All temple, church, mosque, all worship is only to get something out of God. So God has only utility value. Hmm? Not what relevance has truth, reality, God in our lives. So naturally what happens is what you see in the name of religion going on and uh, even people who are religious, what they do, you know, religious, I'm not talking about any figures, but I'm saying is any common man going to any place of worship in any religion of the world. And then you wonder that what is all this? And every youngster questions, I questioned when I was young, that once one preacher had come and I was interviewing just like you were interviewing, but that time on the radio. And the very question, you know, put in different words, was I asked that, uh, and she was a woman, a uh, saintly person, and I said, you all go on preaching dharma or religion or dharma, not religion, but values or spirituality or religion. But we see that in the name of religion, only so much atrocities are happening. So much hatred and those who are religious sometimes, what they do, you know. So, she gave me a beautiful answer, which I repeat. Yeah. And she said in Hindi, Log dharam ko mante hain, dharam ki nahi mante. <laughs> that people follow a religion, don't follow what the religion teaches. Yes. No? That is how uh, she said very beautifully. Log dharam ko mante hain, dharam ki nahi mante. No? So, that is there. So therefore, we should not just create you know oh i belong to this religion or i belong to this group you know or i belong to this mission if i do and if i have a pride of that then what does that mission what does that religion what did that saint prophet guru stand for that when i bring in my life can i say i belong to it mm. you know? like you can proudly say i belong to this caste or i belong to this religion or i belong to this family my family name is this but are you living up to your family name? That's important, no? Yeah, of course. So, yes, whenever we start any work, it appears very small and little. When Gurudev came down from the Himalayas, it was a revolutionary thing for him to explain the Upanishads in English because our masses were all, the educated masses, who were ruling the society, who were bringing in the values into society or the decadence of values into society. His vision was that I educate the masses in the language that they understand. Like all great saints did in the past also. There was a lot of opposition, even though there were other masters who had started speaking in English. But to actually take the Upanishad as a text, you know, to take the Bhagavad Gita as a text, explain the logic of it, and show how relevant it is in our life and our nation building. So he did that. And his own guru told him that four people don't come to your discourse because these worldly people, <laughs> what are they going to be interested? This is meant for really sincere speaker, uh, uh, sincere seekers who will meditate, hmm, who are ready to give up anything to gain the truth. No? But the Bhagavad Gita teaches to a man in the battlefield, man in the marketplace, how from where he is to change his vision, his attitude with whatever work he or she is doing, like I mentioned earlier, and with that, you know, becoming selfless means giving of oneself 
not just killing oneself but giving up oneself and to grow your heart to grow your vision so that you become ready for the gain of the infinite so he said only four people come you come back because that many to you will come in the himalayas also <laughs> himalayas in themselves are lacking of teachers you know so that's why don't go and strain yourself in that place so when he went to the you know found one ganesh temple in pune and got a few people together and said let's have the discourse they publicized this is about you know 60 years ago and uh, no, nobody came except those three organizers so he said my guru said four i am the fourth <laughs> listener myself and he started and in that one session hundreds and thousands of people grew hmm? today on his birth jayanti hmm, we start the centenary celebration and can you imagine from those four people in pune in the ganesh temple over his lifetime and now even after his physical body is not there mission has spread round the world from millions and millions of children from bal vihar no hundred thousands of youth adults have benefited from what he started so even the little you do yeah maybe these millions in the billions are very little but after all in society it is one man who makes a difference okay. one woman who makes a difference well we can say at least we've got a million to make a difference <laughs> we should not rest at that okay. we should all put in our efforts that we reach out to the maximum mm -hmm. and that's the motto gurudev has given for the mission maximum happiness to maximum people for the maximum period of time which our guruji who is the head of the mission swami tejavan ji says in a world where people give maximum sorrow to maximum people in minimum amount of time <laughs> <laughs> well um, from what you have said swami ji is it uh, fair to say that uh, the a mission statement of chinmaya mission and the preachings cuts across all religions all caste systems all denominations financial and so on all demographics yes. would you say that yes certainly because the truth is no one's heritage and the self in each one of us is one and the same it has got nothing to do with your color caste creed those are meant as professional discriminations discrimination means not for inequality but just like you know what a doctor is supposed to do what an engineer is supposed to do it is meant for your duties so that you are clear about your duties these differences in society according to one's nature has got nothing to do with the spiritual truth which is the same for everyone it is not about certain religious beliefs it is the inquiry into who am i what is the truth what is the ultimate purpose of each one's life so it is based on that vedanta is based on that yeah vedanta is there when there was no this path or that path or this religion or that religion you know it is the internal quest of every intelligent being to find out answers to these life questions as to who am i what am i doing here what is this universe what is the cause behind this universe not some concept of a god hmm? but if there is a god who is that god hmm? what is my relationship with that god what is the purpose of my life hmm? how do i find that purpose and if i want to reach a goal how do i train this monkey mind of mine hmm? which even to achieve a small thing hmm, cannot achieve we've got great ideals and goals but that also we cannot achieve hmm? even we want don't want to say something but we still say something you yes. know so our mind itself is not under our control then what freedom that we demand from from the world hmm? we're all seeking happiness peace freedom love hmm? how do we get that that is what vedanta is so who doesn't want it <laughs> yeah so for whom it is not a particular method a particular uh, symbology a certain culture might be different for people but those don't constitute the essence of spirituality 
and uh, in your decades of service to the mission, um, Swamiji, uh, what kind of uh, change and growth you have seen of the mission itself? See, Gurudev has given the great vision and really speaking, he set everything into momentum. So the ripples, the waves, including the tidal waves that he created, is only growing and growing and growing to help humanity. And uh, so naturally, after uh, Puja Gurudev attained Mahasamadhi in 1993, when a great Mahatma gives up his body, we call it as Mahasamadhi. So when he gave up his body and handed over hmm, to Swami Tejamayanji, the head of the mission, he completed all the projects that Gurudev had visualized, including our Chinmaya International Residential School, which was one of the first projects that he completed, which was a big project, so that our children, as you were asking me before also, you know, when they go into different societies, very often they mistake a lifestyle to be a culture. Parents who brought their children abroad were too busy. They came abroad basically for a livelihood. They were too busy making a livelihood. And of course, trying to send their children to give, just get education to get livelihood. Naturally, don't bring up their children wanting as much as they want to with those cultural values, those securities of family bonding, with those, uh, you know, uh, learning to share with society. So naturally our children, confused, are losing their values. So Gurudev, going to America, coming to Australia, uh, very often saw that our younger generations are losing their values, culture, and parents also under pressure. You know, today we have to have income from both, uh, you know, uh, spouses, um, both members of society, our family. So naturally, what was happening is children neglected mm. and we send them to the best of schools, but what are we providing them with, no? So children neglected, they're mixed up and therefore naturally they live the easy and convenient life of just selfishness and extro extrovertedness. They're not necessarily bad people, no? but the real culture, character building no? doesn't take place. So therefore, thought about the school, the Chinmay International School, it was a very ambitious project. The parents from abroad, as well as from the bigger cities of India, would send them to a cultural environment where they get the best of modern education, but a cultural upbringing. So that was the, the various centers. And Gurudev would never encourage a center unless there is activities. No need to just go on building places, no? So like that, after that, also many, many centers abroad. So almost, you know, a hundred centers abroad. While in India, of course, hundreds of centers are there. So hundreds of centers reaching out. Our village programs, which was in one area, you know, has spread to various you know, corners of the country. So a lot of work has been done. And then Australia was just the beginning, you know, uh, you know, but basically, yeah. Gurudev came here just two, three times and he inspired a group of people who continued their activities in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, and then, uh, just before, after his Samadhi, Swami Tejamanji came here, Melbourne got a small little center, he sent me here, then all the activities increased. Some of our youngsters, you know, who have gone back into their family lives and all that, you know, to They've, they've worked so hard. Today they are our you know, yes. mission uh, members, workers. And then some of, even from here, went and became Brahmachari, like our Brahmachari Gopalji in Sydney, Brahmachari Go, uh, Gautamji in, in uh, Melbourne, and then an, another uh, young man from Sydney, whom we now sent to, what to say, uh, New Zealand, Auckland. Then our, uh, one of our West, two of our Western uh, devotees went to India, dedicated their life. So we have Brahmacharini Nivedita and Bendigo, around Bendigo. We have our uh, Swamini Amritananda and Nelson. So like that, you know. And uh, then we started activities in Perth, Adelaide, you know, yes. Brisbane. So we're spreading out as much as we can. And we have people from all backgrounds coming. Mm, yes. mm? Yeah, that's yeah. the next question. In fact, our children are 
obviously, if you see the, a lot of uh, children are getting married to European yeah. boys and girls. And uh, uh, same thing with the people of other religions, other beliefs are coming into uh, the whole, whole world is becoming a smaller place in terms of religion and <laughs> diversity. Uh, how can mission be uh, sustain these uh, children who are the future of the mission to continue this kind of service to the mission? See, any service to society comes only when those who are inspired and dedicated. And those who have inquired, developed themselves. So, mission's vision is the same like Krishna has pointed out in the Bhagavad Gita, that wherever you are, you don't have to be you know, in a uh, building, wherever you are, so Gurudev's vision is that wherever you are, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a lawyer, you're a businessman, you're a plumber, you're from any background, this knowledge which you have gained of the oneness with nature, oneness with all the human beings that Vedanta teaches, no? that Sarvam Kaluvidam Brahma, that everybody is an expression of that one truth, one God. Hmm? And whatever duties you are doing for your families, hmm? your profession, wherever you are, hmm? as I said, give that added value. Hmm? whether it's to your patients, whether it's to your customers, whether it's to your clients. No? Thus, your service to society is not one act of charity when there is a holocaust or earthquake, no? but moment to moment, with whatever you can, you serve. So it is not only that what you do in the mission by taking classes for the children so that we educate the children uh, and give them the character development, which they may not necessarily get in the upbringing as well as in schools and all the spiritual programs that are run in the center but everywhere people are encouraged that whichever way requirement are there so whenever there is even a calamity it's immediately this youth force of ours gets together and whether it's collecting of funds whether it's sending of, of uh, you know uh, equipments now we've been having our global youth camps and family camps and uh, there only we have our village work. So many of our youth who even come from Australia, London, when they come and see that, they even take out time to go and educate the villagers, whether it's in, uh, they are dentists or whether they are psychologists, they come, contribute, help build systems for the villagers. There may not be too many right now, but that's how they go on helping. So it's not just a specific work. Chinmaya mission is wherever you are. The very word Chinmaya, the Gurudev didn't name it after himself. When devotees insisted, they insisted Chinmaya means creating an awareness, creating knowledge. You know? So it's only to create knowledge, spread out this knowledge, this vision of the truth as thought by the great thinkers of the past and the present and spread it to everyone so that wherever, whichever place we are, Whatever role we have in life, do our best. And therefore, for this birth centenary, great masters like Gurudev have given their best, their entire life to us. So, he gave us the best. He did the best. And this year, at least, we must do to give him our best. Hope you guys found the conversations with Swamiji very informative and we will continue to bring you more of this in our upcoming episodes. And after the break, it's all the news from India as well as some Bollywood goss and you get to see why it's my favourite part of the show. Stay tuned. And finally, um, we talked about uh, a one-stop shop for uh, religious organizations, missions which are trying to uh, spread the good, good word and inculcate good values, especially in our younger generation. 
Um, is it a possibility that uh, the mission can take the lead in bringing all these uh, religious organizations together for a layman like me? And I'm sure many of our viewers would uh, be looking for similar advice. They would be confused going to different missions, different advisors, different uh, um, discourses. Uh, do you have a, a view on that, Swamiji? Are you trying to tell me that we should uh, stop all the hospitals around the country, bring them to Sydney under a huge hospital and bring all the doctors in one hospital hmm? and so that everybody can just go to one hospital and uh, get consultancy and uh, all the other doctors should follow just one doctor? <laughs> <laughs> In, in fact, your uh, analogy is very good. If you go to 10 different doctors, you may get 10 different diagnoses of the same problem. And it is the patient who gets confused, in my opinion. In fact, uh, I used to have this argument with my dad, who was a doctor, uh, that you should always keep the patient's well-being at heart. Not what the doctor wants. It's what the patient wants. So I am a patient in this society. I need advice. Uh, I am confused about going to various doctors giving me this advice. How do we combine and bring about uh, the uh, focus on the patient? See, there may be organizations who only want following. Hmm? But every spiritual organization, whatever work they do, is meant only for the benefit of society. If it is not, then it is not a spiritual organization. Right? Every doctor's work is to cure the patient, not grab a patient. <laughs> is it not? So, we must be clear about that. Hmm? In fact, when you say one-stop spiritual organization, then you will have a government, like you find in other, you know, Structure. uh, structures, <laughs> you know, where there is no freedom of thought, there is no freedom of expression, Everyone does not have access directly to a teacher. Many teachers, many paths are meant for a different reason. I remember the very first question answer session I got to meet Puja Gurudev. And uh, I got a chance to ask him the question. Naturally, when anyone has got a sincere seeking, if you're just going, you know what you call window shopping, hmm? even for spirituality, you love to hop like a bunny here and there everywhere. Hmm? And there, a student doesn't go to learn, he just goes to test. Okay, let me see what this guru says, or what this person says. And I can make my better judgment for myself. And every other guru has got only limitations. And finally, I'm the greatest of all gurus. Hmm? This is how, you know, people think. When I actually had started reading some books, and of course, you know how people, the moment they see, you see all these parents also, when the children are not convinced of anything, because here in Chinmaya Mission, they get it so logically with such, you know, a relevance to their life, they'll push them there, you know. And once they go there, no, 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 now you don't have to go there. See, our family guru is this, you know, so come there, you take initiation, now you don't go there, you know. Yes. So that's how the people get confused. Is it a competition or something? No. It's wherever you benefit from whatever is relevant to you and relates to you. That is where you naturally gravitate towards. Now, in your seeking days, naturally, you know that there is something called spiritual knowledge or, or even say religion, religious path, or even certain science or in a particular uh, science of meditation, uh, medication. Now, today you have uh, you know, first we had only one mainstream medicine you call as allopathy, and then suddenly now the popularity of Ayurveda, homeopathy, and uh, you know Chinese medicine, and then you say, are we getting confused? Yeah, we are confused because more the choice, the more we get confused. But you see what is relevant for you at that time, and you make a choice. Why should we stop all Ayurveda? Stop all Chinese uh, herbal medicine? stop all homeopathy just because we want to promote some hmm, you know type of medicine yes. please remember that yes. no yes. so our land is made up of hundreds of rishis address different different students at different periods of time 
they spoke of the same truth but in different uh, con- uh, in with different approach for different set of students that became the different paths later on people call as different religions and when religion become dogmatic and for you know political power position and numbers then you see what evil happens in the name of religion then it is my religion over your religion that's what happens when i started reading books and call it god's grace i always came up with books on you know pure, you know proper inquiry and thinking and they happen to be gurudev's books i had no idea i till today i'm very bad at reading who's the author sometimes i read my own book and i don't know whether <laughs> i'm the author of it i don't i don't know why rarely do i uh, Uh, read the author so i didn't know who swami chinmayananda was so only till i read the geeta i know there was a swami chinmayananda so i read his uh, uh, books and that brought about inquiry and a method of thinking of how do you think you just don't take things blindly so i started thinking now the moment you know somebody sees you reading a spiritual book everybody started dumping their cassette those who have audio cassettes oh listen to my guru listen to my guru yeah. and why i'm open minded i didn't have any particular this so i read only later on in readers digest once i read don't be so open minded that your brains fall off <laughs> <laughs> so this said and then it's not that many of these uh, spiritual teachers were saying very different things there were some of them saying differently etc so of course emphasis on certain practices might be different different but when you're a new fight of course you you get confused since i was open minded i never got confused i went through it and uh, i attended various such sangs at that time naturally you don't know anybody you you're seeking on the spiritual path of course first also i came through the yuva kendra and got to listen to the study groups and all that so i went now there were some very emphatic paths who said you know ours is the only path our guru alone is sat guru you know is and uh, or our guru is jagat guru and this and that and this is only one med- meditation and only initiation from this guru with this mantra then only you will get uh, liberation you know all those are not sat gurus and and some will say that oh all these scriptures are outdated and then for convenience will quote the scriptures to say that my guru says the same thing yes. so i mean if anybody with common sense you know that somebody is there to grab you yes no yes. and if you are a sincere seeker you will never get cheated and if you are sincere seeker you don't even have to hop here and there anyway i got to you know read some books i heard puja gurudev also there was question answer sessions so uh, my question to him was that they say there are many many you know uh, they, i said are there my question was is there one method of meditation or there are many methods of meditation because the moment you become spiritual first thing you want to do is meditation <laughs> and that's the hype of meditation and that's the best selling point for most people also so are there many types of meditation or there's one meditation and this arose out of the confusion of listening to a number of places or people so he in his imitable style just looked straight into my eyes and started laughing is there one type of medication or many types of medications as many diseases that many medications are there you no know? yes. as many special diseases you have that many specialists you need as many diseased minds that many meditations in our own vedas there are thousands of methods of mastering the mind which you call as meditation of course meditation is what you you know finally merge with the infinite so that many methods of meditation are there and then he described to us how you know this meditation is there very dramatically you know how the buddhist will say how the you know this one will say all the med- i said don't ask me what is my meditation you will get even more con- confused you no know? <laughs> and then he understood the drive of my question well, sure. and of course i was only sincerely asking about meditation yes. but this confusion happens hmm? he said hmm? all the great ones not that everybody there are even you know people who don't know anything and speak he says amongst the great masters there are no confusion it is this foolish unintelligent 
sometimes insincere hmm, people who call themselves devotees hmm, that make a disgrace of their masters yeah. you what at that time you need if you are sincere nature will bring you to the right master you are not going there to judge the master but you are going to have hmm, your intellect rubbing with the master and the sparks of knowledge that arises is then your knowledge hmm? so where you can get that knowledge which appeals to you at that period of time and you gain it that teacher at that moment don't go and making a guru surrender as a disciple yes. and a disciple is one who understands the true import of the teacher and to the best of his capacity when he starts off he cannot live many a times there will be a fall let us not judge anybody hmm? and if he has lifted himself when you see such a devotee that he has made it that's a path you can feel very safe to follow sometimes you do not know but you can feel safe to follow hmm? so fin finally you can't be listening here and there because the topic is so vast the path is so grand it's a highway hmm? why do you want to make it into small by lanes hmm? is it not so and if one master cannot re in spite of gurudev reaching out to millions and millions and millions yeah he made sure that we were taught so that we could reach out to millions no yeah? and therefore the work of every spiritual organization every religion in fact hmm, and every hmm, spiritual master is to give this knowledge to their disciples at the time which is relevant to them there are differences in practices because again what type of medication which give <laughs> now if you don't have a living master you just follow that medication take a panadol when you got a headache yes. Hmm? or paracetamol when you get a headache that is a common trend that people will follow then when you go to one doctor he says no no paracetamol is not good for you uh, you know maybe because a certain ph pharmaceutical company says no no panadol has got this defect you have to put that I'm just give an example you no know? so uh, is just this is this one so you give this medication now are you propagating a pharmaceutical company or hmm, you are giving the medication which is good now very often a person does not have idea what medication is taking so he has to have at least that he is a good doctor who is concerned about me who has cured many patients i must have trust in that doctor i can inquire and a doctor must explain but if i don't understand what is the point the doctor at least follow what the doctor says of course no that is why most people follow any path any religion out of faith but out of faith also we should follow what the guru the path or the religion is teaching or even the science is teaching us and if we follow the disciplines soon we'll find out whether it works or it doesn't work then i don't need any belief i know it works yeah, no yeah. so therefore more the many hmm? mm -hmm. yeah do you want to just have one shopping center hmm? or one shop only yeah sometimes it is convenient hmm? but sometimes it's very confusing even one is very confusing <laughs> is it not yes. so really speaking those who are sincere there will never be confusion no those who are insincere hmm, and do not really want to you know be dedicated they hop around get confused hmm? no fault of the saints <laughs> and swami ji uh, uh, one final message to our devotees especially the younger devotees what would that be younger devotees don't become like your adults and regret <laughs> yeah start early in life early to gain knowledge about you yourself recognize your aptitude recognize your purpose recognize what will inspire you nowadays they say you know what passion you have in life sometimes you misunderstand that word get inspiration in your life have an ideal in your life 
have a hero in your life or a heroine in your life. Our ancient culture gives us great heroes like Ram Chandraji, Hanuman. We have Sita, Radha, Meera, saints, sages, great saints, sages, even heroes in every level of society. Arjuna is a warrior. Gandhi as a politician. You know? We have got many such. And even in modern society, take someone as your hero. Live up to that values and ideals that that hero stands for in the field that you want to work with. Don't brush off the ancient knowledge and reinvent the wheel. With all the modern knowledge that we have, look back at how our ancients had that knowledge and how they practiced that knowledge and how they created societies which again declined and again rose and very often because of one youngster daring to be different. Daring to be different doesn't mean that put your cap like this and put your cap like this and put your cap like this or wear a hoodie which everybody does. Daring to be different is if people are bad you dare to be good. If people are selfish, you dare to be giving and sharing. If people are just breaking each other's hearts, we dare to mend people's heart. Yeah. So dare to be different. Swamiji, I am very grateful. And so also I am sure all of our viewers, thank you very much for your time.